Hello, and welcome, um, a little bit ahead of time, to our webinar, Gigabit Networks After Google, for the Intelligent Community Forum. Uh, we're going to be starting in about two minutes, but this gives you a, a chance to get yourself settled and for us to have some more of our audience join us. So I'll be back, back with you in about 120 seconds. Hello uh, and welcome. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. And welcome to the Intelligent Community Forum's next Broadband Agendas webinar, Gigabit Networks After Google. My name is Robert Bell. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Intelligent Community Forum, where I am in charge of most of the research uh, and the production of our content that goes out in so many different ways. So we're very pleased to have you here with us at this point, and we look forward to a very interesting uh, 45 to 50 minutes together. If you're not familiar with us, the Intelligent Community Forum uh, is two things. We are, first of all, a global network of, so, of cities, of metro areas, and counties that we've recognized as intelligent communities, and that network uh, of communities collaborate quite frequently on economic and social development. We're also a think tank, however, that studies how these places, called intelligent communities, use information and communications technologies, not just to become smarter, to, to do things more effectively, efficiently, and cost effectively, but also to build economic prosperity, to solve sometimes very tough social challenges, and to enrich their cultures, to make basically the place called home one of the best possible places to live, to work, to build a business, to raise a family, and to ensure that the next generation uh, follows us. We're best known for our intelligent community awards which, awards, which we've been doing for 15 years, in which we go through a whole year process to select one place as the intelligent community of the year. Uh, from that, however, we the reason we do that program is to gather data. Um, we provide an opportunity to communities to win awards, and they provide us with extremely valuable information. And we turn that into, into programs and products for um, communities around the world. Our Community Accelerator program is a set of workshops, uh, metric analysis, and uh, speeches that are designed to uh, help communities step forward in their own progress as intelligent communities. We, of course, publish uh, both books, white papers, and reports. We have uh, had success in setting up institutes for the study of the intelligent community at, with educational institutions. Uh, there's, uh, of which we're going to be hearing from one of them a little bit later on today. Uh, and the whole point of these is to drill into issues that are the many, many local issues which are beyond our ability to access, as well as to provide a hub for intelligent community development in different parts of the world. This uh, June, we're going to be doing our annual summit once again, uh, which, we, which we've been doing for about 15 years, and this year, we're, for the first time, we're going to be outside North America and in the city of London for Summit 18, and looking forward to that very much. It says June 5th to 7th. It's actually June 4th to 6th of 2018 in London, so you can look for more information on that. And finally, we've uh, been successful in setting up national organizations in a couple of places, Canada and Taiwan so far, and these nations are are places where there is a cluster of intelligent communities and th that want to work together on issues specific to their nation, uh, whether it's advi advising on uh, broadband regulation or, or uh, working together on, on workforce development. So 
this is a very important part of our mission and we're very proud and, and actually grateful to the organizations that have set those up for us. There are currently about 160 cities, metro areas, and counties in that network. They are on all five continents, and uh, they have populations ranging from 10,000 to 12 million, which is a bit unusual, but we believe very strongly that it's not how big a community is, uh, how rich it is in terms of resources that makes it ultimately successful. It's about the people in the community, the leadership, and what they set out to do to address the problems that they happen to face. And those problems all occur around the issue of digital. Uh, we live in an age of di digital disruption. I don't think anybody would disagree with that premise. Uh, the impact that it has on the place called home, however, can be quite remarkably bad. And intelligent communities are those which use today's digital tools, those same disruptive elements, to build inclusive prosperity, to solve social problems and enrich their cultures, rather than letting the digital technologies of the world and their huge impact dictate the future of that community. So today, uh, our agenda is to look at the Google Fiber story, which I'll be doing briefly, uh, but more importantly, to turn to a case study of, a, of a, a gigabit network called Doublelink in the city of Dublin, Ohio. And then we're going to have a, an opportunity to do some reflection with some, some people who are, uh, come to us from Fort Collins, Colorado, and tell us a bit about their experience there uh, be, at the beginning stages of uh, creating an, a, a gigabit network. And we will, of course, uh, at the end, have time for questions and answers. And that gives me an opportunity to turn to you. Um, during this webinar, all of the attendees will be in listen-only mode, but we very, very much want to hear from you. Uh, if you look at the control panel that came with this webinar, you'll find there's a tab for questions. And if you put a question in there, I'll have an opportunity to bring that into the conversation and make sure, uh, to the best of my ability, that your question gets answered. This webinar is being recorded, and that recording will be available on ICF's website following. You will receive from us an email with a link to that as well as to the presentations. And if there is a need for technical support, which we have not, so far as I know, ever required, uh, but if there is, you might want to jot down either the U.S. number, if that's where you're located, or uh, the other number, beginning with plus one, if you're outside of the United States. So I'll give you just a moment to do that. Okay, Google Fiber, 2011 to 2016, a very exciting five years, but rather turned out to be surprisingly short for most of us. Uh, Google launched this project uh, as a trial in Palo Alto, California back in 2011. And then in that March of that same year, in typical Google fashion, jumped into the deep end of the pool by agreeing with Kansas City, Kansas to create the world's first Google Fiber community. And they managed to, uh, it took them about three years to roll that out to Kansas City and about 20 uh, area suburbs in the metropolitan area. Um, and by 2012, Google was willing to say, this is not just an experiment anymore. Uh, the CEO, Eric Schmidt, said, it's, we're actually running a business here. So suddenly uh, what had just been a good idea became a hopefully an ongoing business for them. And so they expanded. They expanded quite rapidly um, to Austin, Texas and Provo, Utah in 2013, to Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, Research Triangle, Nashville, Salt Lake City, and San Antonio in 2014 and 2015. And then came 26 when in uh, 2016 when in October the company announced that all expansion plans were being put on hold and uh, they began cutting some jobs in their division. And they're continuing to provide service, but the, the expansion that had so many of us so excited came to a crashing halt. And by excited, I just there's some wonderful quotes that I picked up online about some of the things that communities did to try to get Google's attention and become the next fiber city. In Greenville, South Carolina, 1,000 of their citizens uh, held, got together with glow sticks to create the world's first and largest people-powered Google chain which was uh, visible from the air. Uh, in Duluth, Minnesota, the mayor jokingly proclaimed that every firstborn child thereafter would be named either Google Fiber or Googlet Fiber. And in Sarasota, Florida, Florida, they actually renamed one of the islands that makes up that city, Google Island. So there was a lot of excitement about it, but unfortunately in 2016, that excitement came to an end. So they managed to accomplish a lot. This map shows their coverage as of today. And you can see that the, the light blue dots are their current fiber cities. The purple ones, which are now all gone, 
uh, from this map uh, are future ones and potential ones no more no more to be seen and then they also have a business doing service to uh, multiple dwelling units which of course is a, a good profitable business in most places um, so 453,000 broadband customers, about 680, sorry, 68,700 TV subscribers, which sounds reasonably healthy, but not in perspective, not less so. Uh, Comcast, the biggest broadband provider in the United States, has 25.1 million subscribers. Charter, number two, 22.6 million. AT&T, 15.7 million. Verizon, 7 million. And that makes that puts Google uh, Fiber's networks into some uh, quite a different perspective in terms of their their reach and power. Why? Well, certainly not because there was anything wrong with the offer. Um, where else could you get a gigabit of capacity into your home or business for uh, 70 U.S. dollars a month, uh, or 100 megabits for 50 U.S. dollars a month, or gigabit Ethernet gigabits service combined with television for 160 dollars a month? And by the way, look at all the storage that you get with that. So it was a terrific, terrific offer, and I'm sure that, and I know that or the people who are enjoying it are enjoying it very, very much. But nonetheless, it wasn't enough to keep the business going. So what happened? Well, a few things happened. Um, the first one, and some of those things that happened were within the control of Google, and some of them were very much not. Uh, probably the first and biggest thing that happened that triggered the change was that Google split into two companies. It's now known as Alphabet on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, Google is one of the subsidiary companies, and it's the firm we know with uh, the online search and everything else that they do, which has become enormous. And on the other side is a company called Other Bets. And Other Bets contains their moonshot program, Google X. It contains a few other things like that, and it contains Google Fiber. And so you have two business units owned by a publicly traded company, and that means that the business unit over at Other Bets is under tremendous pressure to generate results. Um, they're best known for spending huge sums of money. Uh, the question is, what do the shareholders ultimately get back from those huge sums of money? So that began to change the dynamic very, very drastically there at Google, from invest, 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 to invest to get a return. Clearly, and this is not just my opinion, this is pretty generally recognized, they were just way ahead of their time. Um, as much as I would like to preach that everybody has to have a gigabit into their home, I don't think there's a soul on earth who knows what, what to do with that. Uh, I'm sitting on a broadband connection that's uh, officially 50 megabits per second, is actually about 32, but that's pretty good, and I can do just about anything I need on it. I don't know quite what I would do with the remaining 970 uh, megabits per second that would be available to me. So, and this is, you know, this is part of Google's heritage, it's part of their DNA. We all remember Google Glass, right? It was it came out there, it was amazing, amazing technology, and as a consumer product, it just hit the wall because uh, it was way ahead of its time. Interestingly enough, it's now finding new niche applications and everything from factories to uh, surgery, uh, where the ability to see information right in front of your face is very, very useful, but way ahead of its time when it was introduced. Television is also a big factor. Um, you know, broadband 10 years ago was just broadband, but broadband now is television. And increasingly, uh, broadband is how more and more and more Americans actually consume most of their TV. And uh, what Google found was that it wasn't just in the business of providing a gigabit pipe, it was in the, had to be in the business of providing TV. And it was doing so in competition with companies like Comcast, Charter, and so forth, who had been doing this for decades and had very, very good deals in place with content owners. So Google had to actually pay a tremendous amount of money for the rights to the programming that it showed to in its systems. And it was some analysts think that that was the number one reason why they decided to pull out, because they just couldn't make that business case work, paying all that money uh, for the programming. And finally, broadband is a heavy lift. Uh, I think Google learned a bunch of things in the course of doing what they were doing. Um, they did. They were very clever and innovative in terms of going to cities that they worked with and said, we will come in, but you have to make it a lot easier for us than normal. You have to line up your regulatory policies, your poll your rights of way, whatever it might be, your permitting, so that once we once we say yes, we can just start installing. And once uh, a neighborhood says yes, we're interested in this service, we can provide service in a timely fashion. And they did a pretty good job with that, but it doesn't didn't do anything to deal with the competitive problem of the t of the the uh, cable and and telephone titans, who uh, really didn't want somebody else to come into their market, nor would you expect them to. And uh, it just was a lot harder to get the job done, I think, than anybody ever conceived originally. So. 
those are reasons why uh, Google Fiber is where it is. The good news for all of us is that they're not, ne never, are not, and have never been the only game in town when it comes to broadband. And so we're going to look at a couple of other examples uh, today uh, of things that are going on at the grassroots level, as opposed to you know, from on high, brought to, brought to cities uh, that have the most glow sticks in the night. And the first one of those is going to be from the city of Dublin, Ohio, uh, something called the Doublelink Network. Ah, sooner or later, see, your phone, there always has to be something that goes off, so just one moment while I get rid of that call. Thank you. Um, and his name is Doug McCullough. Um, he's the chief information officer there in Dublin, and he was appointed to that role in 2015. Uh, and he brought to it some 15 years of experience in information technology management with the city of Richmond, uh, where he was re uh, their director of information technology, for the state of Ohio's Department of Medicaid, uh, where he was senior program manager, and for the state of Ohio's Industrial Commission, uh, where he was director of IT. Um, he is currently a member of the city's executive team and is responsible for leading the city's IT department through everything from network operations and geographic information systems to this this network of 125 miles of fiber optic called Dublink. I'm pleased to say he's also one of the most thoughtful CIOs that I've had ever had the pleasure to meet, and I'm pleased to welcome him to today's webinar. Doug? Hello. Greetings, everyone. Hello. I'm Doug Pellis, CIO for the city of Dublin, and I'm about to share my screen with you, and I'm wise enough not to attempt to do that and speak at the same time. All right. Uh, hopefully, you can see my slides here. Again, we Doug, can. We can, Doug. Go right ahead. Thank you. So, Doug McCullough from the city of Dublin. And uh, as I was listening to you talk, you know, one of the questions that comes to mind, I think, for a lot of communities is if Google can't do it, what makes me think, as some small community, that I can do it? And we need to reframe our minds to begin to conceive of the concept of broadband deployment as less uh, something that can be affected by lots of money and more by really understanding your community. And that's one of the hallmarks of the intelligent community movement is that it's not about um, just money or resources. It's really about a good knowledge of your community and its particular characteristics. So I want everybody to take, take hope from that. Um, Really, I'm here to talk about how Dublink was uh, developed. There's a lot of literature and some good stuff online about Dublink and its history. Yes, it is a play on words with the city of Dublin. Um, but let me just tell you a little bit about how we got where we are. Um, it was basically developed to preserve our right-of-way from unplanned construction. I think we knew at some point in time that uh, there was going to be a lot of construction around broadband and we didn't want everyone who comes to town to dig up our streets. And so we developed some rules that said if you do come to town after we get this in the ground, you've got to go through our conduit system. So that was really a big part of the purpose there. Um, we developed a franchise agreement with a, a private company, um, and that agreement attracts service providers uh, by helping them avoid the most challenging parts of deployment. And one of the things that's been spoken about, I talk to carriers a lot, and construction and permits are a, a lot more onerous than I think people believe. And it sounds like a simple thing because the construction itself is a pretty simple design. You dig a hole, you put some fiber in it, you cover the hole, you put some grass seed down. But this is in a city, and a lot of times you're going through stone or a historic district, and and uh, that construction is, is, can be pretty awful. Also, the permitting process, most of us as cities believe our permitting process is pretty simple, and all you got to do is fill out a form. But most companies think your permitting process is horrible. And it's, it, it's one of the reasons why Google came to town and said, we'll come to your town if you give us a seamless, uh, extremely simple permitting process to work with. And that's a lot easier said than done. And as I followed their progress, I noted that the public uh, is going to have significant problems with a seamless permitting process. And you need to meet somewhere in the middle. And the permitting process is designed, honestly, to slow things down so that 
officials and inspectors can take a good look at what you're doing and that mistakes can be avoided. And so there's a tug of, of war and push and pull between the desire to move fast and deploy and also the desire not to chop into gas lines and other utilities and dig up yards and, and there's a lot of other considerations. And so our franchise agreement was able to uh, expedite uh, the process of construction and permitting. So because it was our network, we put it everywhere that we wanted it. This was a public-private partnership with a third party, and a key point to that is that we have someone else who can make a profit. And many communities are trying to figure out, how do I fund this? And, and you know, how much is this going to cost? And, and we just can't figure that out. And public-private partnerships are an extraordinarily important thing to explore because you as a community need not be the funder or the funding source, and neither is Google, and neither are the carriers. There are a lot of other options here, and when we began digging into this, uh, it exposed a lot of opportunity for us. So, Doublelink Development Corporation was created as a public-private partnership uh, from a official co company, which uh, had been really just a service provider before that and they created a, another company along with us. Um, when we got the fiber in the ground, we were in a position to give strands of fiber to large employers. So we used it as an economic development uh, opportunity, and this is important because it was not directly funded. Uh, we were able to attract large employers who indirectly, uh, we took advantage of payroll taxes over the course of a number of years, which those additional taxes more than paid for the construction of the fiber. But that's a business model that needs to be described to your city council, to your, to your public, which sometimes is looking for direct subscriber funds, uh, and that isn't always how uh, it works. We also had a significant amount of cost avoidance uh, when we converted our own network over to the doublelink system. It's just a fiber system. It has a, a core network device and edge network devices, and it works almost like a LAN or a WAN, and you can put your phones on it. You can put your, your printers and all of your devices and, and all of your city services on it. Uh, if you're a city of any of the size that we are, um, there are hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings to be gained over just a few years, particularly when you begin sharing those resources with other public entities. And those savings have to be put into the business model of, of funding this type of thing. And then finally, service providers who don't have to do the construction and don't have to do the permits find that an open conduit system is extremely attractive because now they can focus on what they really want to focus on which is being a telecommunications carrier. And we found the ability to lease fiber not only to the big telecommunications carriers, but some of the small niche players who don't want to be in the business of construction and deployment, but do want to be in the business of service provision. And they come along, and we have one of the lower lease rates around, and so we're generating revenue from that. This does take a lot of time. In year one, you're not going to fill up all of your conduit with fiber, or leasers, but uh, it does come along and it does pay for the system. So um, that is the path that we have taken. So what has this allowed us to do? We've had an enormous amount of creative opportunities that, that we have taken basically because the fiber is there. Um, we have a couple of uh, uh, rules of the road that we do not violate, and one of them is we try very hard not to compete with private entities that offer something like a television service. That's not why we're in the business, and the carriers really will come around and eat you alive if you compete directly with them, as I think we're going to hear from Fort Collins. Uh, but we have used it to attract large employers, so instead of turning a profit directly, we give fiber away to uh, to our large employers, and, and that keeps them here, and it, it makes our community more valuable to employers. Um, I mentioned shared services among uh, public entities. One of those, for example, is our Northwest Regional Emergency Communication Center, or NREC, 
And this is our E911 center that allows multiple communities to take advantage of that shared service. And our fiber network is the bedrock which enables that. Um, we have recently connected our Dublin City Schools District. So all buildings uh, within the, the school district are connected uh, via fiber. And that shared service is lowering the cost model of our school system. We don't directly benefit from that lower cost model, but our citizens do. So the costs to residents, many residents don't know whether the, the costs are to a city or to a school district or to a fire department, and they don't much care. Uh, what they care about is how much it's costing them to maintain the community. And so by connecting our schools or folks who are not necessarily under the city, but are public entities, we're lowering the costs for the entire community, and that's a really big deal. We have attracted a number of competitive data centers. Those data centers serve the business community, so it makes our environment more attractive to the business community, and that's, that's kind of a big deal. There's some reputational aspects that happen when you become a broadband community, and folks from the other side of the country or indeed the other side of the world begin to look at your community as an attractive location. And that's something you have to take advantage of. It doesn't just happen because you have fiber or broadband. Uh, but we have and continue to enhance our reputation as a broadband community. And that's a marketing effort that all communities, I think, can do. Certainly, Kansas City has made quite a lot of their uh, deployments so far. Um, it allows you, has allowed us to compete for Intelligent Community Forum awards. We have won either a uh, top 21 or a top 7 award six times in the city of Dublin. And those Intelligent Community Forum awards are a huge attention grabber around the world, as many of you know, who uh, participate with ICF activities. Uh, and then finally, I'll mention that it has allowed us to collaborate on uh, our US 33 Smart Mobility Corridor. Uh, we became a place of attraction for autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles, and all of the kind of IoT and uh, uh, interesting technologies kind of want to gravitate around a community that has broadband. So those uh, opportunities are ones we've taken advantage of. So I guess my message for everyone today is that communities can be independent. We claim that none of these things compete directly with carriers. I think uh, telecommunications carriers would define it differently. We don't necessarily see eye to eye on that. They would say if you're taking customers away, you're competing with us, but we're not selling a service and we reserve for ourselves as a community uh, the right to serve other public entities. We're not a business, we're a government and we reserve that right for ourselves. But we certainly encourage carriers to serve uh, consumers and, uh, and that has been happening as well. Uh, we believe in an open access model and what that does is it allows carriers to come in and provide services through our conduit systems. If they choose not to show up and, and utilize that system and they're not otherwise uh, serving residents, then you have a ready-made excuse for, well, we've got to serve these residents. We haven't served all residents in Dublin yet ourselves, but uh, carriers do show up. One way or another, one of those things is going to happen. I do recommend, as far as our case study is concerned, that you have to build slow. And becoming a broadband community doesn't mean you reach every building in that community. It could mean you just build a ring and you accomplish some technical achievement. Um, you can expand that ring based on funding and jobs and other things that happen along the way. And you do have to have somewhat of a leap of faith. It's not, uh, I think one of Google's challenges had been going all in so big, so right up front. And if they had taken a slower model, uh, they may not have gotten out ahead of themselves. And I recommend that for communities. There are many partners who will participate in funding. Uh, state governments, federal governments, grants, universities. Uh, we talk in Intelligent Community Forum much about the triple helix, uh, how education and uh, the private sector and government can collaborate on things. There are many funding opportunities, but none of them are going to build a complete network uh, in year one. All of them are going to be multi-year, 
you're, you're going to have to be very creative about them. So what's next for us? I believe that increasing demand is a good way to make an argument for broadband and we are deploying devices into our neighborhoods now that we have connected our schools uh, and applications and systems that are intended to uncover public interest. A lot of this is public safety, police and, and some of those safety interests and what's next for us is, is getting those devices into homes that we can interact with as a city. Doing that actually increases the demand for broadband in homes where it's not already or more broadband choice and we're playing a dangerous game but we believe that increasing demand is a way to increase access to broadband because then we as a, a local resource have to solve the problems that we've helped to create. Um, we believe that swapping resources with the school systems who have uh, fiber or other public entities is a good way to extend a network. A lot of broadband is in many communities but it's just not under the control of the local government and that's okay if you begin to swap and begin to be creative with the people who do have the fiber there's a lot of dark fiber out there that's not being used because there are extra strands. Swapping allows us to build a more extensive network. And then finally subsidizing transport, what we call transport. Um, I'm not sure if that's the proper technical term, but there are many facilities who cannot reach a carrier and we believe that if we carry that broadband traffic on behalf of that facility, whether it be a home or a business or a government facility or a university or uh, a school system, uh, we can transport you back to a data center. A lot of times you can pick up a carrier and that carrier has not now had to go through your permit process and they haven't had to go through construction, but they can serve that, that person. This is what we believe many public entities can do to extend the benefits of broadband without themselves becoming a telecommunications carrier. So that's the Dublin story. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back over to you. Doug, thank you very, very much. Um, I always, I, I know the story well. I'm always, once again, impressed to hear it. Uh, whoops, hell, I've got to show my window. Let me show my window. There we go. Um, just a couple of comments of my own, and then I actually have some specific questions from our audience that I want to throw at you. Um, underlying your entire presentation was something that I think is very important, and that is that you know municipal networks like Dublink, the payback is not just financial. Of course, you have to have positive cash flow because that's you know you're stewards of the public's money, but the payoffs to the community are so many and varied, and and it's only in the municipal network context that you can actually realize that that value. You gave the example of economic development. Of I'll give you a fiber. You know, if you bring your town here, bring your 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 company into our community, that's an amazing proposition. And I've actually never heard another community put it quite so clearly. Yes, uh, I think we found that broadband and fiber and technology resources and even technology reputation can be things you can attract people with. Um, we need to break down the dominance of the concept of tax rebates and, and uh, uh, tax breaks as the only resource that businesses are interested in. Ultimately, a tax break is just a number in a spreadsheet. It is a, a dollar amount that a business can say, over the next five years, this is what this means to our bottom line. But a, a fiber or a pair of fiber uh, also give you that number. It may give you a larger number. Just as we've had um, cost savings ourselves as a government, a big company with a very large facility, warehouses and those kinds of things in a community is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars that they can avoid. That's better than a tax break. So it takes some learning, but we, we believe that telling that story is a far better and more effective economic development tool uh, than just, uh, just tax breaks. Well, sure it is, because it's a lot harder for other communities to compete with. Um, the other thing I want to just pull out from what you said was, I, I just, I hope that, I, I wrote a little chart down in my piece of paper, and I encourage everybody else to do the same thing. Under sources of funds, you name three of them. You say, we've well, got economic development from the strategy we just talked about, which generates tax, you know, in payroll taxes or whatever kind of local taxes are generated, which helps fund it. You talked about cost avoidance, which is, again, a, a 
seldom, it's an underappreciated value of these networks. And lastly, the actual direct fiber leasing revenue. And in a way, though, you have these, you have a hybrid funding model, which I think is the way that all these networks need to go. Absolutely. If, if I could throw one more thing in there, I will mention uh, two sources. One of them, when we recently extended our network to the schools, we got a state grant that was on behalf of the schools. We put 24 fiber in, of which the schools need two. That's dark fiber that can be traded and used to build out other networks. And our 33 smart mobility corridor, we got a federal grant in order to connect the network of Marysville, the city of Marysville with the city of Dublin. And the state of Ohio stepped in to build a 432 count microfiber, of which that system will need maybe 20 fiber. That's going to leave us with a uh, out, after uh, negotiating with the state, around 216 fiber for our own use that we didn't pay for. So these are the kinds of swaps and deals and, and negotiations that can be done uh, that you can't see at the beginning of your project, but if you step out and build that first ring, a lot of times the expansion opportunities will come to you. Very interesting. Just some, some, some specific questions about, um, one question is, what is your, is is your duct structure or your conduit structure built on, based on carrier standards? It is. Uh, it is a carrier class network, uh, and we house uh, the big carriers, AT&T, Verizon, uh, all of the big carriers utilize our duct system, and it is in line with their own standards. Okay. And you may or may not be willing to answer this question on a webinar, but what are your lease rates for the conduit and for, the, for dark fiber? I imagine that's subject to negotiation. Uh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. It is, uh, it is far below market rates, uh, and that is all I'll say. It's it's extremely low. Uh, our 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 rates were set 20 years ago when we put the fiber in the ground, and have not been raised since. And uh, yeah, I, I would because I, I'm not entirely certain of the dollar amount. I will tell you it's below anything that you'll get anywhere else. But we do not, well, yeah, we lease to carriers, and it is far below. So whoever's asking that, reach out to me, and I'll be glad to give you those numbers. Okay. Um, well, he's, he's, a, he's a gentleman who will certainly do that. And I have to, here, here's, this is above my pay grade. Do you offer carriers IRUs on dark fiber? We do. Uh, the okay. IRU model, and for those who are not familiar, indefeasible right to use. Um, carriers walk away with something that really looks like ownership and they can do whatever they want with that fiber, hopefully make a big profit and serve the, the community. Uh, so carriers get IRUs, but also uh, large employers, and the IRU is our most effective tool of managing ownership of the fiber. Gotcha. Um, and last one of these questions, I've got there's some others on the, on the panel here, but I'll bring them in later. Uh, about how many years would you say it took for, for Doublelink to get you know, from concept to where it is today? Uh, I would say the initial build uh, took about five years, uh, and we have been expanding it from there, uh, but I would say maybe 10 to 15 years of maturing. Uh, it was a very small network, and the city of Dublin is a small community, but I, I wouldn't do this. If I had to do it again, I would leave myself 10 years to do it. Uh, the amount of construction and work to be done. 10 years. And keep in mind, the actual physical work is, is not the hard part. The community and the culture have to catch up to what the technology is capable of. And as you had mentioned earlier, uh, that was a real problem for Google. They, they have brought to the table an amazing amount of technology, but the community was not ready for it and did not understand how this box in their yard was the future. And so you have to do that along with it, and that takes much more time than the initial deployment. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Well, okay, so we've heard that you used the word maturing and mature. We've heard from a very mature network with a lot of experience, and we're going to shift the conversation now uh, to reflect with two gentlemen on on the future of a network that's just in the, the earliest stages. Um, joining us next are going to be Colin Garfield and Glenn Akins, who are community leaders from the city of Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, Fort Collins is about 65 miles north of Denver, the state capital. It got its start as a U.S. Army outpost back in 1864. 
Um, today is home of about 150,000 people. It's known as a great place for food, for beer, for crafts and craft beer, and of course that Colorado passion, enjoying the great outdoors. Um, in November of, of this year, uh, the citizens of Fort Collins approved a ballot initiative that authorized their city to fund and build a one gigabit fiber network for residences and businesses, including the authorization of a bond issue in a very large, uh, for a very large sum of money if required. It passed with some 57% of the vote, despite the fact that the um, incumbent communications companies reached into their pockets and spent 900,000 US dollars in this city of 150,000 people um, to try to defeat that measure and were ultimately unsuccessful. Um, so they've got, a, they've got as, as someone once said of a hockey player, he's got his whole future ahead of him. This network has its whole future ahead of it. Um, and we're going to hear from Glenn Akins, who's a 20-year veteran of the cable TV industry and a holder of 18 patents and a designer of chips for wireless access points. And also from Car Colin Garfield, who's a former GIS cartographer and a founder of Broadband and Beers, which turned out to be an important part of their campaign. Uh, and both of them represent the Fort Collins Citizen Broadband Committee. So welcome, guys. Glad to have you with us. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Robert. I, I had a, the privilege of interviewing these guys already for a podcast series that we do called The Intelligent Community, which you can find in iTunes Store and Google Play Stores, as well as our website. And again, they're, they're at the opposite end of this process from Dublin. Um, so guys, I want to ask you, unlike Dublin, your, your group chose to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with incumbents that you felt you know, needed to be competed with for the authority to do that. Um, why do you think a majority of the citizens of Fort Collins agreed with you? Well, I think it comes down to the fact that uh, most of our I'm, residents... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, who's, who's talking? Let's oh, I'm sorry, this is Colin. My, my apologies, Colin. this is Colin okay. Garfield. Um, I think what it came down to is that uh, all of our residents who voted uh, understood the idea that we have such little competition within Fort Collins and that a uh, majority of the folks that live here generally only have one option, maybe two at best, and that's Comcast and Centrelink. And I think people also recognize, too, that uh, the city of Fort Collins has an unparalleled track record for providing utility services for the last several decades. Uh, we have the uh, fortunate advantage of owning our electricity and water, and uh, we also have all of it buried underground, so we're beautifully set up to employ fiber optic lines to the community. Huh. Glenn, you have a, any other thoughts to share on that? Um, we kind of went a, a different route, too, because... Uh, the city did some outreach and some polling and and found that there really wasn't much appetite for um, imposing a utility fee or increasing taxes to pay for the network. So one of the goals was for the network to be paid for entirely out of subscriber revenues, and, and that's kind of the route that, uh, that we ended up going down. Interesting. Now, you guys did... Well, actually, I'm sorry. Let me just bring Doug into this. Okay, so Doug, you, you know, Dublin made a decision not to go down this kind of path in particular. And what were the what were the considerations there for you? What what risks do you or downsides do you think you've avoided? Well, first things first. Uh, the city of Dublin does not have other utilities. Many of our neighbors have electrical utilities or water utilities. So there's certain advantages for having the billing system already in place with. Uh, your residents who are used to sending a bill to uh, to City Hall, uh, you don't have to build that from scratch. And so that was a, a bit of a disadvantage for us. And the other thing is, is that the City of Dublin has in the past sued uh, some carriers and has a, a bit of a, not a reputation, but the relationship with uh, some of the carriers puts a microscope on us and it was a fight that we didn't necessarily want to have. And so I think for us, attracting businesses and doing some public use was the right business model at the time. Uh, but you kind of have to look at where you sit in the world politically and, and how much fight do you want to do. Uh, there was not the appetite amongst our residents 20 years ago for this, uh, whereas now that appetite is growing much more. Yeah, yeah. Well, so now, uh, Colin and Glenn, so uh, you guys have finished one fight. I'm sure you're already thinking about the fact that that's really just the first of many. And, and you know, again, businesses that have a successful business don't really want to see it disrupted. So without 
revealing your game plan to us because we don't want to do that. Do you have any thoughts about sort of what the future is when you actually start finding, you know, when service starts being delivered, how is that going to, how are you going to deal with the inevitable competition and, and, and battles that will arise there? Uh, so this is Colin again. So I feel like the city needs to uh, immediately employ their advantages um, starting day one while the, uh, the incumbent providers kind of rally again. And those advantages are, you know, it's, it's difficult for the current providers to compete with the rod speed of gigabit up and down. And the other major advantage that I think that the city of Fort Collins can employ is the fact that they're simply going to be a haven for net neutrality and, and digital privacy. And that conversation is more prevalent than ever. And I think those uh, particular issues resonate incredibly strongly within this community. Mm -hmm. So th this is Glenn, and I I'd kind of like to contrast a little bit about what happened in Fort Collins with uh, what happened with uh, Dublink. Um, we have a regional electric operator here called the Platte River Power Authority that's owned by four, U four cities, Estes Park, Loveland, Longmont, and Fort Collins. And about 20 years ago, um, they built a fiber ring connecting all the cities. Um, and so there's a ring within the city, and then there's also a ring that connects the four cities together. There's some issues with Estes Park because of a flood a few years ago, but we're hoping to get them back on the ring soon. Um, unfortunately, in 2005, the incumbent operators um, passed our Senate Bill 152, which prohibited PRPA from leasing out those fibers to other businesses and outside of what they were existing, you know, they were already doing with their fiber. Um, fortunately for Dublin, um, they didn't have state legislation come in and prohibit them from using the conduit they were starting to build and the network they were starting to build um, and expanding it out to, to, for use for other purposes and leasing it out. Um, so I, I think that, you know, looking back, we see that SB 152 interfered with PRPA's network and the ability to lease that out. And, and looking forward, we're going to be very uh, vigilant um, watching bills in the state legislature to make sure that, that the incumbents don't try to interfere with our city's broadband deployment um, at the state level. That's Very absolutely right. Could, could I add something to that? Please, please. Uh, this is Doug McCullough again. It, what's also interesting is that some of the carriers or the carrier industry has a nationwide view on some of these laws and, and how they, they can strategize on a 50-state basis, whereas many of us are individual communities and individual states, and we don't strategize in a coordinated way. And I think that is somewhat of a problem. And I'm hopeful that we could begin to have a national conversation or continue having a national conversation about, you know, laws or statutes which are so different in Colorado than they are in Ohio. And they really are creating a mishmash for the carriers which are operating in 50 states. I, I would think they would want us all to be operating with the same state statutes. Um, not to be big brotherish about that, but I think it would help us to coordinate as communities better. It's very interesting. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, <laughs> I think it's a double-edged sword, I'd have to say, because uh, I, I would agree with you that they would probably would want a set of regulations that were standard. I'm just not sure that you'd like them. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do what they did in Tennessee and North Carolina and, and use that as the standard. And I'm sure the carriers would love that. Yeah. Right. So you know, again, I mean, it's, it's easy to it's easy to say the carriers are you know are the bad guys. Um, they got businesses to run. We have this interesting you know model in the United States where, where we have a, a small number of extremely dominant carriers in Europe, for instance. They've got even though they used to be state owned, they have a much more robust competitive market there because I think they've worked harder at it. Um, I'm just curious. I think that there's some interesting lessons from Dublin in terms of the funding model and in terms of the the uh, coopetition model with the private sector. In that you ultimately want your your incumbents to, you know, maybe put some of your put some of their service over your over fibers in your conduit, right? You, I'm speaking of Fort Collins here, and you ultimately want to get in a position with them where, yeah, sure, you're all competing, but they're, you're also partnering in the background, which is my experience of the most successful kinds of of markets. Um, again, have you have you? I, I know this is a long way from from you're a long way from those kind of trade-offs, but have those uh, been discussions at the in the citizens committee? Yeah. So <clears throat> this is Colin. Uh, earlier, when this thing was kind of early in its business plan. Um, we had some concerns about the open access model, but you know, we don't understand now that that's a potential source of revenue outside of the direct leasing to subscribers. And the city of Fort Collins has certainly not ruled out the open access deployment. Um, I, I feel confident that there's still 
considering it. Um, however, it's it's to be seen how they actually utilize that relationship with potential private providers. Sure. Well, I know from experience um, of a community in Western Canada that is doing an open access uh, wireless model because it's a, a rural community, so it's all towers. And their biggest, I mean, they're succeeding with it now, but their biggest early stumbling block was just this, the fact that, that telecom carriers are used to owning everything. And they just, they were really reluctant to get on somebody else's tower, to, you know, which is kind of funny because there's a whole tower leasing business. But, um, you know, that's a hurdle to overcome. Um, as I think Doug pointed out, really, it's it's the politics and the and the public that are are, are the biggest issues here. People need to, to understand what this network is about. In fact, Doug, I want to compliment you on the wonderful, I wrote it down because I like it so much. You said broadband is less about money than it is about understanding the community. Um, let's talk a little bit about Fort Collins in that in that context. So, w what is it about Fort Collins and its people that you know is going to a that needs and then b is going to benefit in tangible ways from this network as it begins to get built? That's a big general question, Colin. You're good. At, you're good at big general questions. Go ahead. <laughs> um. Let's do a quick repeat on that question. <laughs> well, I, you know, just I mean, what, what? Let's 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 boil it down. I mean, what do you expect the community to be able to get out of this network as it begins as it begins to become real and to deploy service and a gigabit of connectivity begins to become available? How is Fort Collins going to be different after some period of time than it was before? Well, I think uh, you know, obviously you're going to get the immediate effects of savings and, and customers and local businesses, but I think the long-term benefits are, you know, we're home to Colorado State University. We have multiple hospital systems here for telehealth purposes. We have an Intel campus. We have an HP campus. Uh, we're an incubator for tech entrepreneurship. So I think all of those relationships and abilities to gain from this new service is going to be you know, limitless almost. And I expect in a decade, you know, we're going to look back and, and kind of smile on the, this, uh, the decision we made in 2017 and understanding that not only have we created and fostered these economic relationships, but we've also been basically given ourselves the ability to uh, attract new talent and more importantly, retain talent. And I think one of the issues we see in Fort Collins is that, you know, we have thousands of students who graduate from Colorado State University, but they leave to Denver or they leave to Boulder or somewhere else. And oftentimes they basically create a talent exodus almost. And I think uh, looking forward in, in, in terms of forecasting is that I think especially our, our cities anticipated to grow another 60,000 60, people in the next 10 or 15 years. And uh, that, that uh, luxury that we might give ourselves to retain all this talent, attract all this talent, and kind of bring in incredibly intelligent people from across the community is something that I'm personally looking forward to in the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Doug, let me turn around and ask you the same question except looking backwards. How do you think Dublin is different today um, than it might have been 15 years ago when you, you know, this all started out? You know, I think we've tried to brand around technology and broadband and access and many of those things, but we've tried to maintain our culture and our traditions. Uh, and listening to sort of the Fort Collins view, it's interesting as I look out to their future, it's a beautiful place and we are all worried about these brain drains. And one of the things we're selling in Dublin is our beauty, our amenities, our parks, our trail systems, our water our schools. Uh, we're not necessarily selling technology. And what we have when people can work anywhere is that the most talented people will select the communities which have everything that they love and they will expect the broadband to be there. And we want to be one of those communities where people choose to live and businesses choose to locate. Uh, you have to paint that picture and present it to the world and the broadband just has to be there. Uh, and so we all have to fight. But I, I would say that Dublin has benefited greatly from painting a picture based on the resources that we have. And you can start with a little bit of broadband or a lot of broadband, but ultimately you have to convince people, including those students who are graduating and leaving, uh, why they should come here, locate here, stay here, study here, innovate here. And that's the story we're trying to tell. I think you begin to lose when you just tell a broadband story and say we got fiber. 
um, that's great, but it's kind of table stakes at this point. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, table, exactly. I, it's, I've become really interested in the last uh, few years watching, and I like to think we've contributed to this a little bit, the number of communities that have said, yeah, well, yeah, now we've got the network, we've got all this infrastructure, so now we're a great test bed for autonomous vehicles, for IoT. For It's almost as though, yeah, the highway finally ran by, so now we can build a shopping mall. I mean, it's exactly the same, <laughs> exactly the same thing. Doug, let me just slip in one more quick question before I, I close this out here. Um, this is from our, our listeners. Um, and the question is kind of an interesting one. Would Doublelink as an open access network also welcome Google, not, not the fabric company, but Google and other content delivery networks to co-locate routers on the, on, their, on the network to better bypass ISPs and allow Doublelink's users to directly access their networks? Yes, the answer is yes. And here's an interesting thing. There's a bit of a trick in here to open access that I would tell my friends from Fort Collins. Um, there are companies that really have no intention of going over your infrastructure. We have... Uh, carrier class infrastructure it, it is working for some carriers but a lot of companies they just have no intention of doing that it's either they own it or nothing but open access means open access anybody can come in and serve uh, customers over our infrastructure if they pay a price that is extraordinarily below anything else that they could get anywhere else that saves them from constructing it we would welcome Google we would welcome all of the carriers and many people are taking advantage of it, um, but a lot of people are just going to choose not to, and that gives you ready political cover from saying anyone could have used it, these are the ones who chose to, we are going to go ahead and continue expanding. Very nice, thank you. And I wish we could keep going, but we've run out of time. Um, so I want to thank very, very much Doug McCullough, Colin Garfield, and Glenn Aikens for joining us and sharing um, really some tremendous experience and some tremendous ambitions uh, for the future. So thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you for the time. Thank you. Just to close up, uh, the Intelligent Community Forum, we, uh, we do this kind of thing, we do a lot else. One of them is a set of be best practice reports which are available free to our members and for sale to our non-members. Uh, these are two that have already been published. And this week we're going to be publishing the next in our series, which is about building the innovation ecosystem, the ways in which government collaborating with business and education and other third, third sector organizations can create a self-perpetuating, self-sustaining uh, ecosystem of innovation that will deliver benefits for generations to come. Uh, our next webinar in the series of the Broadband Agendas is going to take place on January 23rd. It's called Six Small Steps to High-Speed Networks. We're interested in driving, uh, drilling down into the details and looking at specific things that a community can do if it's not ready to uh, take the, 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 the big step of a Fort Collins uh, to, to leap out into a future, but instead wants to move the ball up the field in ways that uh, its city council can understand and approve of. And so that's, that's going to be our focus next time. Uh, coming events, I uh, mentioned already that we're going to be in London in June. We've uh, gone through two phases of our annual awards program, selecting our Smart 21 communities, which are listed on our website. Uh, in February, date to be determined, we're going to be announcing the top seven intelligent communities, uh, of which Dublin has been one numerous times, Doug pointed out. And that, of course, is, uh, is a matter of choosing one out of every three of the Smart 21 to go to the next stage. In June 4 through 6, we'll be in London for our ICF Global Summit that year. Uh, always a fascinating time. The kind of conversations that you heard today are, are bread and butter when we get people from 12 or 15 nations together to talk about their common problems and unique solutions. In the last day of that, we will announce one of those top seven as our Intelligent Community of the Year. And this year, for the first time, we're going to publish on June 18th a list of the world's top 100 intelligent communities drawn from uh, the last six to I guess, or eight years of data uh, in, our, in our database. Uh, and we're really looking forward to that. It's going to be quite an interesting competition. So uh, please, I, I want to encourage you to follow us on Twitter, to uh, Look for us on Facebook or LinkedIn. All you have to do there is search for the words Intelligent Community Forum. I can guarantee you'll find us. We are definitely one of a kind. Uh, you certainly can also follow our podcasts on the iTunes Store, Google Play, or on our website at The Intelligent Community. So please remember, wherever you are, whatever you do, whoever you connect with, there is no place like home. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>